Um, all right, why don't we get started? Um, I, I know a lot of the people on the screen, but not everybody. And welcome Vermonters who are joining. I'm Danny London, also a Vermonter. As you can see from my background, um, I'm actually in, in Evanston, um, a Beth Emmett member, um, but I have very strong connections to Burlington, Vermont, uh, and to Aaron and Jeff, having grown up in Burlington. Um, and, you know, I, I put up this background just so you could get a sense of what Burlington looks like. Um, I'm where I am is you can kind of see the, the bay of uh, Lake Champlain and in the background Burlington Vermont which is this little town of I don't know what is it 38 40,000 people somewhere around there which is 45 to be now 45 well, we've hit the big leagues um, it's the, the biggest city in Vermont is Burlington Vermont um, with 45,000 people um, and you know it, it didn't occur it strike me as odd when I was growing up but it, it, we had a thriving Jewish community in this little town in northern Vermont, you know, for less than an hour from the Canadian border. Um, and um, I, I think what strikes me as really interesting and compelling about the story that you're going to hear is that, you know, all over America, there are these little Jewish communities that all that have really fascinating stories. I mean, these Jewish communities came from Jews who immigrated from somewhere. And in the case of Burlington, Vermont, a lot of the Jews immigrated from the same area of Lithuania. And as a result, growing up in Burlington, you know, every time we went to Shoal, my, you know, my father would say, oh, that's so-and-so, that's your, you know, your third cousin. Oh, that's so-and-so, that's your second cousin twice from what, you know, it was just, I discovered that I was related to all these people. And it took a while before I realized it's because, it was really a uh, one immigration that somehow brought all these people to the same little town in Burlington, Vermont. I'm sure you're going to hear a little bit more about that from um, our speakers today. And so let me introduce them. Um, our speakers are Aaron Goldberg and Jeff Potash, who are on the board of directors of the Lost Mural Project and were the catalysts behind the move of this lost mural that you're going to hear about in 2015. Um, the, they then brought on board conservators who have successfully um, completed a restoration of this mural and had it relocated from the location, the wild story that you're going to hear about where it was and, and where it is now in Ohavitetic Synagogue, which is the synagogue that I grew up in and that my great grandfather was, uh, was a founding president, was the founding president of uh, long ago. Um, I, I should mention that Aaron Goldberg is uh, my brother-in-law, and I've known him since I was very little. Um, and Jeff Potash is somebody I also grew up with um, in our in our congregation. And um, Aaron and, and Jeff still live in Burlington, Vermont. Aaron is a retired elder law and estates planning attorney um, who, as I said, grew up in Burlington. Um, he is the co-archivist of Ohavitzedek Synagogue and a co-founder of the Lost Mural Project um, back in 2010. Um, he's the Vermont contributor to the online New England Jewish Historical Collaborative Resource Guide. Who, know, who knew there was a New England uh, collaborative, uh, Jewish Historical Collaborative Resource Guide, but it just goes back to my point that every you know, region of the country, you know, we, we usually associate American Jewish history with like Hester Street and, um, you know, the Lower East Side and, um, you know, maybe parts of Chicago for those of us who live in Chicago. Um, but we don't think as much about the little communities um, around the country, like Burlington, Vermont, where there's so much fascinating Jewish history. Um, Jeff is a former professor of history at Trinity College. He has taught and published extensively on local history topics. Um, among other works, he is the co-author of Freedom and Unity, A History of Vermont, and the author of Vermont's Burned Over District, Patterns of Community Development and Religious Activity, 1776 to 1850. Um, if you say on afterwards, he's going to do an hour and a half lecture on that topic. So, um, no, I guess not today. He's shaking his head. Uh, <laughs> but that sounds really interesting, too. Um, among other books that uh, that he has has authored, um, Aaron and Jeff, as I said, are both natives of Burlington, Vermont, and have collaborated on many projects and presentations about the Burlington Jewish community. Um, they were the contributing archivists for Vermont Public Television's production of Little Jerusalem, Burlington's Jewish Community, which is a fabulous documentary um, if you're interested in small town America Jewish history. 
Um, I recommend it, and I have discovered in the last couple of years that it is still still available online. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn this over to Aaron and Jeff to introduce today's topic and, and share with us the fascinating story of the lost mural. Thank Great. You, Thank you. Thank you, Danny. We appreciate that. Well, first and foremost, thank you all. Um, thank you, Beth Emmett. Uh, thank you, Marcy Dickman, Rabbi Andrea London, for inviting us to speak about Burlington's immigrant Jewish community called Little Jerusalem and the ongoing Lost Mural Project that Aaron and I have been engaged in for many, many years. Perhaps an appropriate way to introduce those two topics is with two quotes. Um, the first from Philip Rubin, uh, and I am struggling here. Why is my screen not working? I, there we go. The first from Philip Rubin, a former Burlington resident, writing in a New York Jewish magazine in 1949, observed, quote, we were a Lithuanian Jewish village that happened to be stranded in Vermont which was only superficially affected by American ways that basically lived and maintained for a whole generation. I think Aaron and I would say more than a generation, it's Eastern European Jewish pattern of life. A second quote comes from, uh, speaking to the international significance of the mural from Dr. Peter Manso, who's the curator of the American religious collection at the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, he testified in 2021, quote, the lost mural is a symbol that crosses generations and validates the universal story of communities built by refugees and immigrants in the community. The ability of future generations to learn from this important piece of American history depends on actions taken today. The need to further preserve and restore the mural is urgent. It is essential to safeguarding its legacy. Burlington's Jewish community, as, as Danny has alluded to, dates to the late 1800s when a group of recent Lithuanian immigrants joined together to form the Ohavi Zedek or Lovers of Justice Congregation in 1885. All were peddlers in the area. Nathan Lamport had achieved greater success in the form of a peddler supply shop within walking distance of Burlington's bustling waterfront then America's second largest lumber port that provided him ready access to the traders along the lake. In all practicality, though, the story begins much earlier in Lithuania, a small country in Eastern Europe on the Baltic Sea. More precisely, the story originates in a small rural village outside of Kovna, Lithuania. With few exceptions, the first hundred or so settlers in the 1880s were almost entirely residents from a single shtetl or village named Sheshishka or Chaikashak in Yiddish. Nathan Lamport's three brothers and his sister quickly joined him in settling in Burlington. More important or impressive was the, act, uh, was the arrival of Lamport's nephew, Max Rosenberg, who subsequently returned with his grandparents, his father, five uncles and their families, an extended family totaling 42 members. Morning, everyone. The geographic character of Czechoshka resembles Burlington. Both share a similar climate based on latitude and longitude, and both are situated on water and surrounded by large rural spaces. I had an opportunity to visit my ancestral home in Lithuania in 2007 and discovered that the village still retains a lovely pastoral character. The farmland and animals are similar to the valley and tranquil Winooski River abutting Burlington's Old North End. Even today, the village of Czechoshka still retains its old world appearance, consisting of homes and businesses that in shtetl times offered a variety of services, including butchers, bakers, and a dairy, catering to the needs of its Orthodox Jewish population. Lithuanian Jewry began, began migrating to the Baltic states after expulsions from Western and Southern Europe. Lithuanian Jewish communities are documented in Lithuania as early as the 14th century. Synagogues were built in the 17th century of stone and masonry and hundreds more were built of wood in less affluent communities in the 18th century. 
The synagogue in Czechoska is located in the town center opposite a church and within walking distance of the homes to facilitate regular attendance at daily prayer services. During my visit to Lithuania, I gained entry into the abandoned Czechoska synagogue where I discovered the structure was totally empty with the exception of a painted plaster arc. The artwork around the arc depicts symbols of the 12 tribes of Israel. Though I didn't realize it at the time, we have since learned that this arc was the one of the last remaining painted arcs in Lithuania, according to Dr. Samuel Gruber of Syracuse University, an expert in worldwide Jewish art and monuments. Sam's expertise, as well as his support for the Lost Mineral Project, can be seen on his blog at samuelgruber.com. This is another detailed picture of the columns to the right of the Czechoska arc. We now realize that the Czechoshek um, immigrants who settled in Burlington's still rural North End in the 1880s were inspired by its remarkable semblance to their former home. The synagogue they built, too, looked very much like the one they had left behind. And uh, now. Jeff, you should be on 14. I'm, I've gone. I'm not sure, Aaron, where there's a missing one, but um, I, I'll continue on with, uh, with, with what we have. I don't know why this uh, slide presentation doesn't uh, incorporate. Do we have the right one up? Um, good question. It, it was the uh, slideshow that we, that we said were the final slides. And let's, um, yes, I'm not. I'm not sure, Aaron, why uh, why it doesn't incorporate those slides, but uh, I'll take it anyway from where we are. Um, so, the. Distinctive character, uh, oh, excuse me, the, what you're looking at here is a picture of the second synagogue that was built in Burlington. And that second synagogue was built two years after uh, the original synagogue, which was Ohavi Zedek, the Lovers of Justice uh, synagogue was constructed in, uh, on uh, uh, um, two, two, store, two doors away. This particular synagogue, Chai Odom, came about in, in 1889. Now that's four years after Ohavi Zedek congregation was formed. It was formed as a result of a schism, uh, though the community re uh, retained only about 100 or 150 residents in total. Uh, there was a skirmish between two individuals. Uh, stories have been told in innumerable ways. One argued that the particular individual who had created this synagogue, man by the name of M.L. Levin, was the first to achieve success in the business realm. He had converted from a peddler to an actual shopkeeper, and the feeling was that um, he thought that uh, he could he could draw a, con a constituency uh, to his particular synagogue. He accused uh, Ohavi Zedek, the congregation, of having allowed a German Jew who had married outside the faith onto the Bema. That was a no-no. The Ohavi Zedek Synagogue, in turn, accused uh, Mr. Levin of keeping his doors open on Shabbos. Uh, anyway, beyond that particular, beyond those particular issues, we want to call attention to the fact that this synagogue resembles a wooden synagogue uh, that, uh, uh, that would have appeared in most communities throughout Eastern Europe with the exception, as the arrow indicates, of this funky little Victorian apse. It's confused us for the longest time, and in consulting with Sam Gruber, who's essentially looked through monuments across um, any number of, uh, uh, of, of areas throughout Europe, uh, Sam has convinced us that the Victorian apse was most likely, it's unique, and um, what you can see is that the apse uh, at the bottom contained the area for the ark, that was punched out, and then it has this funky slate roof that ultimately, as you'll see shortly, becomes the palette 
uh, that's used to create the lost mural in 1910. Here is the picture of the original Ahavi Zedek synagogue that I had mentioned earlier. This is the building that is constructed in 1887, originally in wood, bricked in 1902, and two doors away from, uh, from the, uh, the Chayon of synagogue. As I say, Aaron and I have expen expen expended a tremendous time over the course of the last 40 years. We've interviewed any number of folks um, who once resided in the community and could share stories. And um, they're quite remarkable as Aaron has alluded that, or as Danny has alluded that, um, that uh, film that Vermont Public Television has done on, on Little Jerusalem captures that, I think, to some degree. Jeff, um, I think it, you're on slide 13. I'm sorry to interject. But if okay. you go to text in slide 13, I think that's Okay, good. So um, what, what um, again, my text is a little different than yours, Aaron. So uh, what, what, um, I'm going to suggest is that what this piece illustrates, and it's very important, is that the folks from uh, the, the shtetl were in, in effect replicating the shtetl feel that they had left behind in Lithuania within Burlington. The stars indicate the two synagogues within two buildings of one another, and the dots underscore the fact that the residents who had begun to settle though they retained for most and for all intents and purposes in the 1890 census, they retained the status of peddlers. They were still transients of sorts, but the homes that they settled, the, 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 uh, the residences that they, uh, they, they uh, settled in uh, were very much within a walking distance within one to two blocks of either synagogue. And Aaron's research on, the, uh, on his family highlights the fact that as people became more successful, as their uh, status and wealth uh, increased, um, they began to move ever closer to the synagogue itself, so that the uh, the, the well-to-do residents were, uh, you know, within literally a block of of the synagogues themselves. Okay, Aaron. So I think we're on slide sixteen. Yes, please. In 1903, Burlington's Jews were still largely a mystery to the resident population. An article from the 1903 Burlington Free Press offers this explanation of the Jewish population. Quote, it is said by Rabbi A. Moskowitz of the Jewish synagogue located on Hyde Street, High Autumn Synagogue, that when he first came to Burlington in 1887, there were only about a half a dozen Jewish families in the city. Since that time, he has been acting as the head of the little church, also killing, inspecting, and selling meats in his congregation. The people of the nation in this city seldom intermarry outside their own race, and if they do, the ceremony is not performed by the Jewish church. Their homes are for the most part of a very ordinary character, although the race is shrewd in a business way and secure not a few of the American dollars. As the village grew and evolved, it expanded its shtetl village character. By 1910, Burlington's Jewish community had grown significantly to an estimated 800 or so residents. The community boasted a diverse array of essential structures, occupations, and services needed to sustain their orthodox lifestyle. This included a synagogue, cemetery, ritual bath, kosher butchers, kosher bakery, dairy, grocery, and a minion, the prayer group of 10 men. In effect, they had transplanted their, transplanted their traditional East European shtetl model to Vermont. The distinctive character of Little Jerusalem's insularity continued during the decades leading up to World War II. UVM sociologist Ellen Anderson, in her 1937 pioneering sociological work titled We Americans, A Study of Cleavage in an American City, used Burlington to assess the accuracy of the melting pot theory. While most immigrant groups in, Jer in Burlington had largely assimilated within one or two generations, a majority of the Jewish Burlington residents continued to eschew social contacts and maintain their traditional insularity. The distinctive, uh, the village became known to its residents as Little Jerusalem. Its story, as I mentioned to you, is told in loving detail in Vermont Public Television's award-winning 2012 historical documentary produced by Dorothy Dickey. Uh, Aaron and I served as uh, uh, contributing archivists for this wonderful hour-long film. You can actually view it online, um, Google Vermont Public Television Little Jerusalem, or go to our website, the lostmural.org, uh, for information uh, about it. Uh, but let's return to the story of the lost mural. 
1910 was an important year in the life of Little Jerusalem. A third synagogue named Ahavath Gerim, or Lover of Strangers, was formed by the most recent immigrant arrivals who felt socially inferior within the existing Jewish community. And while the three Orthodox synagogues were effectively in competition with one another in 1910, they had all agreed to, to create and build a single Talmud Torah consisting of two floors of Hebrew school classrooms and a social hall on the third floor that served these shared needs of the flourishing Jewish community for life cycle celebrations and observance of Jewish holiday gatherings. In 1910, both the Ohava Zedek Synagogue, shown here, and the Chai Adam Synagogue underwent renovation and refreshing. At Ohava Zedek, that work included the addition of a new copper work surrounding and covering the wooden ark undertaken by a congregant who was a tinsmith. Dr. Sam Gruber has opined that the old Ohava Zedek copper ark is also one of a kind in the entire world. In an effort to refresh its building, Chai Adam decided to add a mural on the ceiling space above the ark to supplement the painted art, art and prayers around the ark and on the building's walls, and to paint the entire synagogue ceiling a sky blue with open air effects. We only have this single black and white photo detailing the artist's work. Above the ark on the right and left sides is the abridged text of the Matovu prayer, a goodly are thy tents of Jacob. Immediately above the ark and under the painted decalogue is the abridged text of the Kimitzion Tetzei Torah prayer, for out of Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In 1910, Chai Odom Congregation con contracted with Ben Zion Black, a 24-year-old immigrant from Lithuania, to add a mural on the ceiling space above the ark, which houses the Torah scrolls. Black was a professionally trained artist as well as an established theatrical producer from Kovna, city roughly 29 miles uh, from Shaikashak. Black came to Burlington following his love interest, a woman by the name of Rachel Sager, with whom he fell in love while in Lithuania after casting her in a play. Notwithstanding the family's apparent dislike of the rakish character, Black and Rachel married in 1912. Tradition says that Black painted the mural in six months directly on the pre-existing plaster walls and ceiling using an oil-based paint. For painting the front ceiling mural, along with traditional prayers on all of the synagogue walls, together with blue sky and clouds on the building's ceiling to create an open air effect, Black was paid the handsome sum of $200, equivalent to roughly $5,800 in today's terms. A lifelong resident of Burlington until his death in 1972, Black earned his living as a sign painter, specializing in gold leaf. Many of his commercial designs and logos continue to this very day. Knowing the identity and background of the mural painters of Eastern European wooden synagogues is truly rare, but we know a great deal about the lost murals artist, Ben Zion Black. He was not, interestingly, an active synagogue goer, but rather his passion in Judaism was largely secular and culturally rooted, and his life was spent in working to preserve Yiddish the language of the Jewish people. He established both the Jewish Cultural Society and the Yiddish Cultural Society in Burlington. He also regularly sponsored actors from New York City and Montreal to perform Yiddish music and plays in Burlington. And he himself produced Yiddish plays and concerts with local community talent, while also writing, acting, directing, and singing. He wrote hundreds of Yiddish poems, some of which we have in our Ohavi Zedek collection, along with his original Yiddish typewriter. A book collector, when Black died, his Yiddish library of over 4,000 books was donated by his daughters to the, to the uh, Montreal um, uh, library. In 1939, Chai Adam Synagogue closed and reunited with Ahavi Zedek. Subsequently, the building was sold and converted into a business space, most notably Harry Wheel's carpet gallery. Harry, Harry Wheel stripped the building of everything other than the lost mural itself, which we learned from his son-in-law, spoke to the observant Catholic Wheel. In 1986, when the lost mural building was sold and plans were made to convert it into an apartment building, 
George Solomon, then of Burlington, Vermont, alerted me to the disastrous construction plan for the former synagogue building. I arranged with Black's two daughters to have professional pictures taken of the mural, then in a wheel carpet warehouse for archival purposes. In, 1980, in, in, in addition, with the agreement of the owner at the time, the Francis family, and at the suggestion of the Lost Mural Project's coordinating conservator, Richard Kirshner, then with Shelburne Museum, a false wall was constructed in front of the mural in the apartment to allow the future possibility that the mural might survive and later be saved. In 2010, the Lost Mural Project arranged with the then building owners to assess the condition of the lost mural. Tenants had unwittingly been living in front of the false wall from 1986 through 2010. A small hole was cut into the apartment's east facing false wall of the second floor apartment to examine a portion of the hidden mural. Lights were used to determine the lost mural's condition after being hidden for 24 years. What was clear is that the insulation which was placed behind the false wall by the family's contractors, having been placed too close to the mural's surface during the apartment conversion process, had created some moisture issues resulting in some of the paint having visibly flaked off. We lost about 10 to 12% of the paint. Still, the lost mural's rich colors captured in 1986 archival pictures were quite visible. During the time period between 1986, when the mural was hidden away, and 2010, when it was then re-examined, new academic research also chronicled the almost total de deconstruction, destruct, I'm sorry, almost total destruction of East European wooden painted synagogues and the accompanying artistic genre of Jewish mural and prayer wall paintings. After consulting with several museum and historical experts, the Lost Mural Project was strongly encouraged to make all possible efforts to preserve the lost mural and now to educate about it, which they characterized as a surviving remnant of our Jewish artistic and cultural heritage, a unique example of Lithuanian art and cultural heritage and our collective immigrant experience. In 2012, the purchase of the Chai Adam building by the Offenharts family presented the opportunity to rent the apartment space and to undertake the full removal of the false wall in order to complain to in order to obtain a complete analysis of the condition of the mural. Damage across the entire mural was clearly visible. Again, the result of insulation having been placed too close to the mural surface. And on close examination, we also discovered that much of the remaining paint that was attached but 85 to 90% of it was no longer completely attached to the plaster. In 2014, the Lost Mural Project secured sufficient funds with which to hire Constance Silver, a conservator specializing in art restoration. She began a painstakingly detailed six month pro project to stabilize the flaking paint on the plaster in anticipation of a future move. Honey Silver had to re-adhere 85% of the paint, which had separated away, pulled away from the plaster. The process involved using a thermosplastic emulsion adhesive on the back side of the paint, together with pieces of mylar to press the paint pieces into the flexible wooden lath slat the hordes behind the plaster. The adhesive could then be activated with heat and attacking iron so the paint could be gently flattened and reattached to the plaster. Silver reached out to Susan Buck, a painter and finishing, a Finnish conserv, uh, conservation analyst from New York City. She asked Buck to uh, explore the original coloration scheme by doing paint samples to determine what uh, if anything had uh, transpired in terms of the coloration scheme of the of the uh, of the uh, mural, Buck's paint sample test analysis confirmed that multiple layers of varnish, with layers of accumulated soot and grime, had built up over the years as a result of the coal burning heating system, and had altered the original coloration scheme of the mural. Susan Buck also confirmed, and this was a question that uh, Connie Silver originally had regarding the what she conceived of as an excess of drapery. Susan Buck confirmed that all the original drapery present in 2010 was original. This image shows the mural and colorful painted surface, enve surface enveloped in a white webbing before cutting the lost mural from the interior walls takes place and before the framing of the lost mural in its current steel case. 
With Connie's initial cleaning of the lost mural at the Hyde Street location during December of 2014, the results were quite unexpected. The dull green interior drapes showing in the original 86 slide, 1986 slide that we showed you reemerged as a royal blue. So two purples, pistachio and crimson red colors were also newly exposed. Our advisors were all dancing on the tables with this news. In Exodus chapter 25, verse four, God instructs Moses that before the people left Egypt, the Israelites should accept gifts from the Egyptians. Quote, and these are the gifts that you shall accept from them, gold, silver, and copper, and blue, purple, and crimson yarns. Blue, purple, and crimson yarns, of course, were the most expensive dyed yarns in the ancient world and served as a mark of royalty. These colors were directed by God to be used for the tabernacle hangings, coverings for the prayer service utensils, and as coverings for the priestly vestments. At the recommendation of our art experts and conservators, the blue-green right side angular wing was separately cut from the wall. We intend to exhibit this piece in our future educational exhibit, which we're currently working on and designing, that will allow visitors to walk around it on the, at the floor level and see the front paint and the plaster and the structural lath supports going behind it. It also has Benzine Black signature gold leaf shown on the bottom right in this slide. The missing left side wing did not survive the 1986 conversion of the Chi Adams Synagogue into the apartments. So now we need to address the remarkable feat of actually moving the 22 foot by 11 foot mural from Chi Odom Synagogue from the, the, uh, its original location uh, to a Hobby Zedek Synagogue in May of 2015. The question, how do you move a 22 foot by 11 foot mural? The first step undertaken in October of 2014 consisted of building a large heated three-story temporary structure completely around the portion of the building containing the mural. Constructing this building resolved the concerns raised by our coordinating conservator, Rich Kirshner, regarding significant variations between the extreme winter outside temperature and the heated indoor apartment temperature, potentially causing cracking during the cold winter months and the possibility of further damage to the mural. By November of 2014, the second floor extension of the temporary building had been constructed and work had begun on a remarkable roof or removable roof attached with screws. During December of 2014, third floor roof trusses were installed with beams. The temporary structure was completed in January of 2015 with the slate roof of the building's apse then encased within the temporary structure, work could continue during the coldest winter months. In March of 2015, the entire slate roof was carefully removed, each slate numbered and the underlying wooden roof at the end, uh, excuse me, at the rear of the lost mural uh, was exposed. April 2015 was a busy month. A renowned conservator, Norman Weiss from Columbia University was brought in to apply a special consolidant to the rear of the mural to strengthen the lath board, slats behind the plaster. An extra framing was also installed. In 1986, even before the mural was hidden behind a false wall, architect Marcel Bowden of South Burlington, Vermont first conceived that the lost mural could be encased in a frame and lifted out of its old home. These plans drawn by Reliant, by Reliant Steel are based upon the one-of-a-kind engineering specifications of Robert Neld and Oren Gutman of Engineering Ventures, Inc. The steel frame was welded in place, yes, with a welding torch within the wooden frame building, within the temporary shelter built on Hyde Street against plywood, against additional plywood support which was applied to the rear of the mural to increase the stiffness of the mural plaster on the lat. The steel frame was designed to serve the lost mural in multiple ways during the rescue operation, including its stabilization, lifting and extraction, transporting, depositing the mural in front of its new home, pushing it into the lobby, and finally lifting it with chains to its final destination within its steel frame supporting it. To add many support, to add needed support while being transported to its new home, the mural was, was braced by many layers from the front and the back. The actual mural is within the wrapped black layer shown here on top of the white air cushion. Now the fun begins as the lengthy plans prepared by the architects and engineers, contractors, steel workers, carpenters, painters, and crane operators 
and truckers began to unfold. At Ojabi Zedek Synagogue, work was undertaken to install suspended iron beams in the ceiling to hold the mural aloft. To accommodate the size of the steel framed mural, the entire front entryway was removed and a wooden a landing pad installed. The entry doors and windows will subsequently be replaced with special UV glass lighting and shades. A 3 8 of an inch steel floor was placed over the lobby slate floor to protect it in the lobby itself. May 6, 2015, moving day. Early in the morning, the contractors unscrewed the temporary roof and a 50-ton crane carefully lifted and deposited the roof onto a large roller at street level, where it was then pushed away from the building. And remember, the temporary portable roof had to be put back on top of the building immediately after the lost mural was removed from it. Next, crews inside the second floor of the temporary shelter worked with the riggers to connect the crane cables and belts through the carefully designed fitted holes of the steel mural that would secure the lost mural when it was lifted and moved. And actually, those uh, they still support the mural in its current stead today. Aaron and I worked with two members of our original planning team, Marcel Bowden, an architect, Rick Kirshner, our coordinating conservator. We all watched with bated breath as the 75 foot, excuse me, 7,500 pound mural within its protective steel frame was lifted out of the building and deposited uh, on a, a specific style truck. The red arrows show the extremely thin plaster uh, less than three eighths of an inch width of the lost mural while it is being lifted, floating in the air during the moving day. To add additional needed support, the mural was wrapped in layers from the front and back. The actual plaster mural is behind the wrapped black cushion shown here on top of the white air cushion. Additional supportive layers that were installed in front of the plaster mural included uh, starting from the mural's plaster surface and then moving outwards, silk, a web material, a waxy layer, uh, the wrapped black cushion, a white air cushion, plywood boards, and steel tension rods. After being secured with straps, the mural began its historic, slow, and steady three-tenths of a mile journey to its new home, passing by the original 1885 Ojabi Zedek Synagogue on Burlington's Archibald Street in the process. While the transport truck is moving up the hill, the large crane was moved into position along a temporary sloped gravel road bulldozed adjacent to the synagogue entryway. Once again, the 50-ton crane carefully lifts the mural, this time from the bed of the truck, and delivers it onto a landing pad in front of the synagogue. Wheels are attached to the pre-drilled holes in the steel frame to accommodate the final 50-foot move. With less than one inch of clearance, the mural is manually pushed by the steel riggers across the landing pad and into the synagogue lobby. The following week, the steel and wooden stabilizing flooring then is removed. The now 6,500 pound lost mural is hand pulled by chains and pulleys up to 11 feet, its original height in its former home. And it is then attached to the five suspension rods extending from the steel frame into the specially installed I-beam. So here you see the mural in 1986 when the archival slide was taken in Hyde Street and in 2014 when it was also on Hyde Street. So what do its symbols and colors mean? The symbolism of the lost mural incorporates a number of primary symbols of Judaism. At the center are the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue that sit on the throne of Solomon, which is described in the Book of Kings. The commandments are supported on either side by heraldic rampant lions, familiar in Jewish tradition as the Lions of Judah. Above the commandments appear a crown and a ribbon. The two Hebrew lyric words on the ribbon can be translated as Keter Torah, crown of the Torah, the crown also reflects the presence of God as further captured in the sun's rays. One's immediate attention on the side panels focuses on the base of the vertical columns that draw the eye from the bottom to the top of the mural. The imagery of the four columns is a reference to the original temple in Jerusalem. 
Suddenly, as Dr. Samuel Gruber observed, the theme of the lost mural becomes clear. With its newly discovered bright red, blue, and purple curtains and the marble columns substituted for the bibl biblically described acacia wood tent poles, Black's unique lost mural depicts the mobile tent of the tabernacles as described in the Bible. The mobile tent is the portable sanctuary tent built by the Israelites in accordance with God's specific instructions after they left Egypt. According to Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 through 9, the mobile tabernacle was considered to be the earthly dwelling of God inside of the sanctuary tent within the camp of the Israelites. The book of Exodus also tells us that the tent of the tabernacle is partitioned into two sections. The first is the outside entrance tent called the holy place, which houses an outside altar, table, and utensils. The second is the inside area called the inner holy of holies, housing the Ten Commandments. This image shows the wooden beam, wooden roof beams on the left side of the thin plaster mural. The face of this wooden beam will be subsequently used for a green border, which we will discuss shortly. If you look to the right edge of the center panel along the ridge between the center and right panels, you will also see testing squares, which show different levels of cleaning of the lost mural of its harmful varnishes. So let's look at this image from the left side moving towards the center. The book of Numbers, chapter 4, verses 6 through 12, specifies that the first section, outer space, called the holy place, be separated from the second by royal blue and purple curtains, separating it from the innermost space. In Black's words and Black's action here, you move from the outer tent courtyard with its marble columns wrapped in the red curtains, passing by the window portals looking outside through the tent, which Black creates using a trompe l'oeil effect, through both the royal set of blue curtains royal blue curtains and the shimmering purple fabric into the most inner sacred space called the Holy of Holies. While in biblical times, only the high priest was allowed entry into this most sacred space housing the Ten Commandments, it appears that Black, the, the, the recent immigrant, may be suggesting that all people are now welcome to enter into the Tent of the Tabernacles. When the lost mural was hidden away in 1986, no one realized that hidden beneath the darkened layers of varnish and green, and varnish and grime were vibrant light greens, crimson red tablets with silver lettering for the Ten Commandments, bright yellows, and royal blue and purple curtains all waiting to be revealed. The Lost Murals palette contains a full spectrum of lively and joyful colors, which speaks to Ben Zion Black's artistry, creating a time portal which reopens the centuries-old East European tradition of synagogue wall paintings, grounded in biblical references and the enduring spirit of immigrant hope across generations of immigrant and refugee history. Dr. Joel Elkies, a former resident of Kovno, Lithuania, in the 1920s, told us that the vibrancy of Black's colors captured the vitality of Jewish life in Lithuania. For many centuries before World War II and the Holocaust, Lithuania had been a joyful center of Jewish life, prayer, Talmudic studies, and Jewish arts, including an exponential expansion in literature, music, paintings, poetry, sculpture, and theater. In 2014, prior to his death, Dr. Elkies reminded us that saving the lost murals colors was tantamount preser to preserving, quote, the magical world of my earliest childhood. Now, I'm not getting ahead of myself. By March of 2021, we had successfully raised funds required to begin what we called the first phase of our full cleaning project. Now, here you see the impressive three-story scaffolding that was constructed to give our two conservators, Constance Silver and Jennifer Baker, direct access to the entire mural. A crucial first step that needed to be undertaken both prior to and repeatedly during the cleaning involves sampling paint and sending it on to Amy Ives Cole, an historical paint and conservator analyst at Sutherland Consulting in Maine. Each of the colored circles that you see here shows a numbered paint sample testing area. This is one of Cole's reports. Analysis of paint samples offered definitive cross sections revealing layers of material that had accumulated on top of the original paint and glazes used by Ben Zion Black. Notice, 
Working from the bottom upward, each test sample reveals a base white color. That would have been the original paint pigmentation. Additional glazes in some cases, and in all instances, layers of additional varnish embedded with dirt, grime, and dust. It is important to remember prior to the 2021 full cleaning of the mural that while some portions of the mural retained vibrant colors exposed through partial cleaning, the mural as a whole remained largely one-dimensional in its muted use of color and shadowing. This slide offers a visual perspective of the thinness of the plaster layer situated on top of the lath boards. Look at the right white edge of the lost mural at its thickest against the lath board on the right side of this image in the bottom corner, the plaster literally is three quarters of an inch thick at the top, roughly a half inch, which you cannot see in the middle and on the left side is that the plaster is generally 1 16th of an inch thick or even less. Located to the right side of the lion's head are more paint sampled areas indicated with yellow and red dots located within the light pistachio sun ray and the light purple curtain. Looking within the insert white rectangle and by reviewing the varnished squares from left to right and top to bottom, one can see the effects of cleaning the darkened varnish with differing amounts of solvent and how it lightens up the pistachio and purple colors with each successive sample. The image on the left side of this slide shows the clean 10 commandments in the fall of 2021. The 1986 image on the right shows the darker defined line between the two tablets and the shadowing curvature of the bottom of the two tablets, all of which were subsequently restored by glazing the bottom area of the tablets by the second team of the conservators in 2022. Here, the roundness of the columns and the shadowing effect of the column bases, the central bay, and along the curtain edges show additional depth achieved by the trompe, the trompe l'oeil effect utilized by Benzine Black to achieve the three dimensionality for the areas located inside and outside the tent of the tabernacles. The, the left panel, the left image here of the lost mural shows how the varnishes darken the colors. If you compare the same areas within both the left image from April, 2021, in the right image from September 2021, you can see the remarkably lightened and vivid colors, such as the pistachio green sun rays, purple curtain, and brown columns, with their marbleized white and black paint swirls, all clearly pictured here after the removal of the darkened brown varnish layers. By September 2021, the Ten Commandments are red with silver letters, the lions are golden, the jewels within the crown are shimmering, and the throne of Solomon is orange. The base of the throne is now green and clearly defined with its three-dimensional recessed internal area revealed by the different shades of green and designs and shadows depicted within the throne of Solomon. Also notice the light emerging from the sun even more intensely going towards you within the top portion of each sun ray. Within each of those rays also, we now have the white and blue colors bleeding into the pistachio colored rays and the red and orange colors bleeding into the yellow colored rays. This picture is in June of 221. Phase one of the cleaning project started in April and by June, it was 40% cleaned, meaning of cleaned of its varnish. This composite photo, composite photo is from July 15, 2021. It's actually a flattened image made by seaming five photos together. The conservators were then able to use this image to investigate and determine the visual depth of the paint colors by zooming in using their computers to any interior area and going into depth and seeing how much depth each area had in terms of color and in and, and terms of its hue on their computer. Look how vibrant the colors are now. After the darkening varnish layers, the charcoal dust layer and the dirt layers are removed from the original paint surface. A clear coat of isolation varnish is applies to, applied to the surface, optimizing the light within existing within the original colors. All fill work and coloring will be done on top of the clear coat layer. The entire restoration project is then completely reversible based upon the techniques being used, utilized by the conservators within the Williamstown Art Conservation Center. 
Now here you see the center panel um, before and after the clear coat of isolation varnish is applied with the right image illustrating the light existing within the original colors. Here you see uh, the uh, panel uh, again showing the clear coat of isolation varnish having been applied. Uh, the right image illustrating the panel after the clear coat uh, has been applied. And here you see the center panel uh, after the clear coat of varnish has been applied. Again, what we're trying to illustrate here is just the vibrancy of the original colors. We continue to learn more about the artistic, cultural, and historic significance of Burlington's lost mural while unraveling the study and the story of the lost mural itself. In February 2022, we, we continued our conversations with Vladimir Levin, the director of the Center for Jewish Art in Israel, which maintains an internationally accessible database for Jewish art and architecture. The lost mural in Burlington, Vermont, is one of only two remaining examples of Lithuanian mur murals painted in the style of interior wall-painted wooden synagogues, according to the Center for Jewish Art. Dr. Levin estimates that Lithuania alone had over 700 wooden synagogues before World War II. He opines that the majority, around 500, were, were wooden painted synagogues. Of this group of 500, Dr. Levin states that there is only one now in Lithuania proper. There are two painted wooden synagogues that have survived. One is in Romania and one is in Lithuania. One is, uh, the one in Lithuania is, is, is in a village called Pokroi in Yiddish. Uh, it was recently restored in 2017. Ironically, and against all odds in the weight of history, the other exceptional Lithuanian example illustrating the lost genre of painted wooden synagogues is located in Burlington, Vermont. And in fact, the Lithuanian ambassador and uh, several Lithuanian ambassadors and consular office, uh, officers from Israel have come to visit the mural. This shows you, Jeff, you go back one. If you go back one. This shows you the Pokeroy painted wooden synagogue after the restoration was completed in 2017. So here you see the lost murals that looked in 2021 after the phased one cleaning was completed. You can also see the left and right wooden roof beams upon which the replicated green side borders will be mounted as recommended by our Williamstown Art Conservation Center conservators and our art experts, Janie Cohn and Richard Kirshner. The original mural that was photographed in 1986 did have the green tent borders, so the entire lost mural was enclosed in the green borders of the tent of the tabernacle. This was recommended and we just completed doing this in November of 2022 in order to for the lost mural project to properly present the lost mural both as originally envisioned and painted by Ben Zion Black. This archival slide from 1986 highlights the last required piece of restoration work completed in the phase two full restoration of the lost murals missing paint and colors, which began in January of 2022 and finished in November of 2022. Notice the original green border with a decorative curtain balls painted along the right edge of the mural. There was a similar border on the left edge that had been lost during the 1986 building conversion to apartments. Together, these two external green edges framed the lost mural and defined the outermost tent sides uh, with the green borders. Unfortunately, the remaining right border planter pieces, which had been saved, were incomplete and far too fragile to reinstall. However, the border details from the rescued pieces allowed our conservators to zoom in on different areas and compare the multicolored hues and shading within um, each area to gauge the correct green shade for the lost mural project to replicate. We reproduced both green tent borders. You can see the cracked areas of the plaster pieces that were fit together like a puzzle by the conservators from Williamstown Art Conservative, uh, Conservation Center to do their painting and color analysis. Restoration of the green tent borders of the tent of the tabernacles and the sky, skies of the clouds 
uh, are uh, follows where, next. Where, you're, where you're going. Yep, go ahead, Aaron. So these are just some additional slides in, indicating how we did this. So the first slide shows you the left and right ten borders, tent borders from the 1986 slides. The next slide shows you on the right side of your slide is the pieces that are put together like a puzzle. They're the rescued pieces. The left image actually shows you a sample of wood that was done, which where the WAC, where the Williamstown Art Conservation Conservators are are doing samples both of painting, the, both the stylistic of the paint and the brush stroke in order for them to actually match, match Benzine Black's brush stroke and coloration. The next slide is our master carpenter and master craftsman, Ray O'Connor. He is affixing rear mounting square boards, which will actually receive another board, which is actually the front green borders for the left and right board. So there's a mounting square border on, on the back of each one. And these are mounted first, the borders then come from Williamstown. They're delivered, they're prepared off-site and they're delivered on-site. So these are the only piece of the mural that had to be replicated from the pieces. The next sh slide shows you the, the actual green border, which is affixed to the mounting slide boards. And you'll see that there are red pins, which are actually holding them in place temporarily. And you can also see a little bit of the fill that is necessary to fill the area before, between the, uh, the right edge of the border and the marble edge of the column, which is the outside edge of the mural. And that's then filled in. You'll see in the next slide too. And you can see that we've also had to enlarge the tent framing now so that the white, the, once the green borders are up, we have to accommodate the increased size of the top that was then missing that had been cut out of the mural uh, when it was cut out from the building frame and was actually behind. So this piece is actually located behind our false wall. So the white pieces are installed. So you can see the full tent shape is, is taking shape. And that's prior to the painting of the top border. And if you go to the next slide, Jeff, you can see that in order to, there's a, there's a small area where you have to extend the black, uh, the black striping and the tassels that are painted on the side of the red curtain balls in order to complete Benzine Black's imagery. And that is then completed with the next slide, which shows the blue sky and the cloud area. So this shows you the actual completion of the green tent borders. So the, the way this was done is to another uh, contractor is also brought in to, to work on the expanded sky uh, after Williamstown had done the piece that was within the mural. And then our, another contractor comes in and works on the white board. These photos are taken in November, 2022 by, by Eric Bassett. My job is to wrap this up and express tremendous gratitude to all the folks, and it goes on and on, who are too name, uh, numerous to name for helping us rescue, move, and fully restore the lost mural. And um, of course, we want to take a tremendous uh, moment and express gratitude to the, to the friends of the lost mural, our, all of the folks who served on our board, our individual and foundation donors, our appreciation to the folks dating back to the 1980s, Marcel Bowden and Rick Kirshner, uh, Janie Cohn, and to more recently, our historical consultant, Sam Gruber at, San, uh, at Syracuse University and Josh Perlman uh, in Philadelphia and the Jewish Museum. We wanna express our gratitude that you made it through the entire hour with us. We've shared with you pretty much everything we know. Uh, and uh, we are at this juncture happy to uh, turn you back to that nifty slide that shows what the mural finally looks like. What Ben Zion had originally intended that none of us could ever have imagined back in 2010 or even 1986 when we set our eyes on this. Um, and uh, it resides currently in the lobby of Ohavi Zedek Synagogue. And if anyone happens to be coming from Evanston, to Burlington, wants to take in the bay behind Danny or wants to take in the mural, um, we, we'd welcome your coming and we'd love to share it with you. Thank you for allowing us to tell the story. Thank you, Aaron and Jeff. Do, uh, the hour is up, but do you have time to take a question or two if people have questions? Yes, of course. Wonderful. Uh, Mike, I see your hand up. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question on the owner of the 
was it the rug store who yes. obviously was the first person who made sure it stayed was he of jewish descent no he was a french okay. canadian he was a catholic french catholic uh he, we we've spoken to his jeff and i were in that carpet store in our when we were in high school we remember it quite quite clearly <laughs> uh and uh his we've spoken to his son uh who indicated that his father was quite struck quite uh quite enamored of the lost mural and and did everything he could to at least preserve the main central panel uh, the rest of the built the rest of the entire rest of the synagogue was converted into a warehouse by the time and, by, by the time he already by the time he already uh occupied it and and just real quick i mean the term that we use repeatedly is serendipity and that's the first of the serendipitous events that transpired aaron's decision not to relinquish the mural in 86 when it could have been bulldozed is yet another and it goes on and on thank you i see another hand please uh, uh me yes please Helene. Oh, oh okay um i was Two years before you began this project, I was at the University of Vermont in Burlington for the last CAGE conference that existed then, and that was in 2008. So I had no idea about this, although I had been to Sarah Kleansky's show, and she, and the first time I met her, was at my daughter, <clears throat> daughter Susan Rosenberg and Matthew Kleansky's wedding in 1987. But this is amazing. So thank you. Well, and what's interesting is when Aaron, you know, and Rick, uh, you know, got the <clears throat> owner in 1986 to seal it, you know, at that juncture it was simply a local curiosity that no one envisaged had any value. And it was really Sam Gruber after we exposed it in a series of experts in Israel who said, oh my God, this is a what they characterized as a Holocaust survivor, and it's been repeatedly uh, represented in that in that form or fashion. Our former governor of Vermont, um, Madeline Cunin, who's a member, uh, you know, refers to it lovingly as a Holocaust survivor. And Aaron, the term that she uses, doing Madeline this. describes lost mural as a symbol of freedom over oppression and hope over despair. And uh, just so everybody's clear, this entire project has been documented to museum quality and research. So we have thousands of images of photo with photographs, videos, interviews, treatment reports, conservation reports. We've been working with international experts, uh, both art and architectural and historic preservation experts. The uh, we're working now working with the Center for Jewish Art in Israel and the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia and the Yibo Institute in New York and the Smithsonian and the US Holocaust Museum to make sure that our information gets documented and they get to, they get they become depositories of our information. That's all part of this next phase of the Lost Mill project which is completely dedicated to the educational mission. Jeff and I have been doing dozens of these uh and we also do tours and um the state of Vermont has fully embraced the project. All of our all, every step of our process has been documented with public television and with our local community access television and broadcast statewide. So we are indeed doing everything we can and hope that you can spread the word and help us develop an on-site and educational space. Come and come visit. If you have any questions, I mean, go to thelostmural.org, get in touch with us. However, we can be helpful. Please let us know. And tours can be requested on that website too. And thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I see another. Why don't we take one more question? Lindy. Lindy, oh. you're on mute. Not hearing you yet, Lindy. How about that? There you go. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Now, I've seen I've seen the synagogue in Pocroyus. Oh wow. And uh, was this one was this uh, mural actually done in 1886? This mural was done in a synagogue. It was founded in 1889, but it was painted in 1910. 1910. Yes. It's wonderful. Thank I you. loved it, and I think you did a splendid job. Thank and I was good. so disappointed not to be able to see a painted synagogue, not one when I was there. 
It's sad. really it's really sad. There's less than a dozen that are the extant originals, and several of them are in the Israel Museum. There's a few in Eastern Europe, and uh, that's what's so remarkable about this piece is that you know this was this has been documented as a true Lithuanian cultural and artistic heritage item, and more importantly, this is part of our collective historical artistic history. Yes. <laughs> for, for hundreds and of years, for hundreds of it, years. It's the only one that's been preserved, isn't that right? Well, there are about, there, 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 so there, there are there are many uh, that have been partially preserved. Uh, there's never, there, as far as we know, at least in this country, we, we and we think in North America, there's nothing that's like the lost mural, according to Dr. Gruber. Uh, and in terms of what's what's interesting about this is that we know so much about the artist, and and but we've also been very successful in bringing in the artistic consultants and the historians. So we've been able to document from day one how you could actually preserve something like this. And so we have managed, we've managed to completely maintain the integrity of his original painting. I'm thrilled. <laughs> thank you. Well, Aaron and Jeff, I want to thank you on behalf of Beth Emmett and everyone on online for a really terrific conversation and sharing this amazing story it's with me. Interesting. I've, I've heard the story many times and every time I hear it, there are new elements that fascinate me from the fact that you had these two synagogues that you know couldn't you know communities that couldn't get along within the community that built right next door to each other to <laughs> you know the article in the paper from whenever that was a hundred years ago or more that you know is a very interesting take on or, or attitude toward the jewish community the jewish race so, and the jewish church a, exactly Z xenophobic at the very least and and, <laughs> and probably a, a bit racist um i mean that's an interesting direction you could go but also you know just the project itself and the passion that you yes. both of you and others have taken in, in doing this historical preservation is amazing and you know aaron and jeff when when we grew up in burlington vermont it was a pretty racially homogeneous uh, town. Now it's a much more racially diverse place. And I, I think, you know, for example, about the Somali refugees who now have made uh, Burlington their home, kind of like the Lithuanian refugees of a sort who made uh, Burlington their home. And, um, and, you know, I wonder if any of them have seen this mural, because I just think, you know, what are they going to be thinking about 75 years from now or somewhere around there where they're you know, wondering about things that have been lost about their story. And wouldn't it be great for them to kind of hear this as an inspiration to them to kind of preserve the story the, of their the, the short answer, The short answer to that question is yes. So we just we just had a what we're called the the Burlington High School students resistance resistance field days. And Burlington High School ninth grade teachers who are teaching history and civics are doing a whole curriculum on on activism in the face of cultural erasure. And so they brought the entire ninth grade class, 250 kids came to Burlington, came to the Havazetic. And we had other speakers who spoke up about, uh, about the immigrant and refugee and, and racial issues relating. Uh, we had four speakers. One was a, is a black minister who spoke upon about black clergy and black politicians. And then we had a, we had a Somali uh, refugee who spent 10 years in a Kenyan refugee camp uh, before they came to Burlington. And then the next day we had somebody from Tibet and another person from, uh, from uh, Bosnia. And so, yes, we're making a concerted effort to get uh, into public schools. And yeah, we that's do fantastic. that program statewide. And next, next month is South Burlington's kids. Well, thank you. And thank you to everybody who's online for this program. Um, I would encourage you, if you want, are interested in learning more or perhaps in making a donation to support this project, to go to lostmural.org um, and, and make a donation there and, and get more information. And people Danny, can reach can out I to ask us. One more question. Please. Uh, real, yeah. real quick, Lindy. Sure. And you've just gone back on mute. So hit that mute button again. Um, how do you how do you reconcile with with thou shalt not make graven images? So the image that's shown, according to Dr. Gruber, of course, does not illustrate God. God is represented by the Ten Commandments. So God is the law. The lions are both the guardians of Israel and they're receiving the law and they're guarding the law. The throne is the throne of Solomon. We don't even show Solomon. And so what, what Black has done is he's met that tradition. We, there, there's, there's millions of pieces of Jewish art, particularly Haggadot and uh, Passover plates. And there's many zodiac signs and many artistic pieces, but ours is consistent with that entire Jewish tradition of showing that the throne, the 10 commandments, the lions, the crown, the ribbon of Torah, and sun rays. God is the sun, uh, or the sun rays, at least, in the, within that tent. 
And uh, this, you, there's no graven image in making a mobile tent of the tabernacles. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Lindy. Thank you, Aaron and Jeff, again. And thanks, everyone, for joining.